Good morning and good afternoon to all our participants. My name is Susana Siar, and I'm a fishery and aquaculture officer at the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. The United Nations General Assembly declared 2022 as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. The two webinars we are holding today and tomorrow are intended to celebrate small-scale fisheries and aquaculture in Asia, which is home to the world's majority of small-scale fishers and fish farmers. These webinars are only two of the many events and activities to celebrate IAFA 2022. In addition to creating awareness about IAFA 2022, our two webinars are aimed at reflecting on the importance of small-scale aquaculture and fisheries in our daily lives in the context we are in and stimulate concrete actions to support and champion the cause of small-scale fishers, fish farmers, and fish workers towards sustainable and secure livelihoods, ecological well-being, and participatory governance. Before we start, I would like to hand over the floor to Sherlyn Anthony Sami, Director of InfoFish, to introduce our awesome speakers and resource persons. Sherlyn, over to you. Thank you very much, Susanna, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this very momentous uh, event that we've all been waiting for and excited to start. Uh, before we begin, uh, just, just a quick um, uh, request or, or information for our participants. We have a smooth session. Uh, this is to inform you that this meeting is being recorded and also it's being uh, live streamed right now to InfoFish YouTube channel. So please spread the word around, uh, share the links to your colleagues and the network so that they may be able to share wherever they, they are able to watch wherever they are. Also, uh, for any question and answers that you may have uh, to pose to the panelists uh, during the session, you may use the Q&A tab that you see at the bottom of your screen. So now to move on and introduce the awesome panelists that we have today and tomorrow for today. First off, to deliver the opening remarks we have with us, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Rohana Subasinghe who is the Vice Chair of the International Steering Committee of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. Dr. Rohana is a specialist in aquaculture development and aquatic animal health management. After 22 years of service, he retired from FAO in October 2015. Uh, in his uh, capacity in FAO, he was responsible in implementing many FAO programs and projects on aquaculture and aquatic animal health at the national, regional, and international levels. Next, I am happy to introduce uh, two important people under the coordination of the Department of Fisheries Thailand. We have Ms. Kantana Sang Sinkior, who's a business consultant with Prime Farm Company, and Ms. Namoy Samprasong, who's the president of Community Enterprise Lamsai Patana in Thailand. They will be sharing with us the, um, the work of the Women's Cooperative in Thailand, uh, which will be presented by Ms. Kantana. Next off, we have Dr. Somoni Te, who is the Director of the Department of Aquaculture Development of Fisheries Administration in Cambodia. Dr. Somoni and his colleagues have devoted all out efforts to promote and develop aquaculture research, education, develop an extension in Cambodia through various development and research projects with the UNFAO, JICA, ACIR, CAFS, IRD, CIRAD, USAID, and GIZ. Um, in addition, Dr. Somani has worked as project managers, coordinators in various fisheries management, rice field fisheries management, and aquaculture development in Cambodia for more than 20 years. And I'm also happy to introduce Dr. Ben Belton, who's a global lead for social and economic inclusion at Wolfish Center Malaysia. Dr. Belton's research focuses on political economy and aquaculture and capture fisheries development, value chains and food systems, livelihoods, rural economies, and their links to food and nutrition security, poverty, well-being, and the environment. So 
We have a very distinguished list of rich um, panelists today, and uh, we're all excited to hear what they have for us and in this important event. Uh, I'm handing over now back to you, Susanna. Thank you, Charlene. So to start our webinar on putting a spotlight on small-scale aquaculture in Asia, let me call on Rohana Subasinghe to deliver, to deliver the opening remarks. Rohana, you have the floor. Can you, <clears throat> can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna, and thank you very much, Shirlene. It's so nice to be with you today and to celebrate the International Year of uh, Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture 2022. I, it's, uh, I thank FAO and I thank um, InfoFish for organizing this seminar and the uh, regional office in Asia, and which is absolutely pertinent to discuss about small scale fisheries and aquaculture in a global terms. Um, I'm going to give you a very small, short introduction of what the International Year of Partner Fisheries and Aquaculture is and what we plan to do and what we are looking forward to through this year of uh, celebration. Um, right. The background and objectives, the whole International Year of Fisheries and Aquaculture started in 2024, 2014 when the small scale fisheries guidelines were adopted by the FAO member countries. Since 2020, 2014, in 2016, FAO COFI, a group of Latin American and Caribbean countries proposed the International Year on the Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. In 2017, United Nations General Assembly declares that 2022 as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, that was declared in 2017. Today, 2022 International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, we celebrate this title, this event it, throughout the year 2022. That's where you are. The object, there are two main objectives of the International Year. One is to enhance a global awareness understanding and action to support the contribution and sustainable development of small scale artisanal fisheries and agriculture to food security, nutrition, power eradication, and the use of natural resources. I do not need to emphasize how important uh, artisanal fisheries and small scale aquaculture in Asia, as we all talk about that 80% or 75% of the aquaculture production in the world come from small scale. Uh, art producers and artisanal fisheries are also extremely important and which uh, employs so many million people uh, and providing livelihoods. The objective, second objective is to promote dialogue and collaboration among small scale artisanal fishers, fish farmers, fish workers, governments and other partners to further strengthen their capacity to enhance fisheries and aquaculture sustainability, social development and well-being. It's a whole two main objectives, of course, for awareness building and collaboration and dialogue. The, we have what we call a IYAFA Global Action Plan. The Global Action Plan is a high level and inspired document for all stakeholders. The Global Action Plan supports implementation of existing normative instruments such as uh, small scale fisheries guidelines and its support of the sustainable development goals and ongoing UN indicates there are several uh, sustainable development goals with uh, emphasis on fisheries and aquaculture. So you can see it's on the screen and the Global Action Plan supports the uh, there's UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There are several pillars of the Global Action Plan. One is environmental sustainability. The other one is economic sustainability, social sustainability, governance, gender equality, food security, resilience, all along. And there are six, seven major pillars which 
are part of the global action plan on international year of uh, fisheries and aquaculture the these pillars provides you the basis for the action to be taken uh, examples of activities in the uh, iyafa uh, global action plan there are four major activities it will one is to raise awareness the second is to strengthen science and policy interface then also to empower stakeholders and also to develop partnerships so we will be doing more mobile exhibition showcasing cultural traditional or small scale artisanal fisheries and aquaculture with some documentation which supports strength and science and policy and learning exchanges for empowering stakeholders holders and partnerships and platforms for small scale food producers for developing more and more partnerships for future and there are three main areas which ensures effective operationalization of the international year there are several un decades programs are within at the moment of um, un decade of family farming action on nutrition several and then you have uh, international instruments like uh, uh, small scale fisheries uh, guidelines and various other guidelines of uh, done by various agencies and then of course you have a strong political process going through the FAO committee on uh, world food security and world trade organization etc and all these three areas um, provide more um, emphasis and the platform for effective open operationalization of the national year the global action plan is available in six languages you can see on the screen where to get it if as you wish please go through and you can download that document and you can get involved with the international year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture celebrations by building activities into new or existing projects implementing activities of uh, gaps reach out you can reach out to the international year by uh, virtually and through the websites and uh, visual identity guidelines a lot of information available on the iyaf website please do visit and um, without taking further time and we thank you for listening and you're going to listen more and more about the activities small scale fisheries and aquaculture their importance during the today and tomorrow and please do um, join further celebrating the international year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture throughout 2022 thank you thank you very much rohana uh, for walking us through uh, iafa 2022 the next segment is organized by the department of fisheries of thailand on the th on the theme of empowering women I would like to hand over the floor to Ms. Kanthana Sangsinkeo, who will deliver a presentation on a community enterprise. Ms. Kanthana, you have the floor. Good afternoon from Thailand. My name is Kanthana. I will be representing Thailand as a presenter as I have my whole session interview with uh, Ms. Sam Oi. Let me start with the agenda today. As you can see from the community enterprise Lamsai Patna from Patumtani province in the central area, we have an agenda to present to you comprised with uh, seven major topics. The first one, uh, we would like to walk you through the background and the settlement of this community enterprise. It's comprised of the structure, the management, and the number of the members. Then we go to the second topic, the main accountability, task, action, and drill down to the activity that each of the members are doing this. And then come on the third agenda, the primary, the secondary product with the distribution detail channels. Then come 
in a very interesting top fourth, the income average per month, and then with the support unit and the department major aspect of the uh, food innovation, the product development, the verification process from the Thai FDA, or even the very interesting drug packaging design and other aspect. Before the last topic come, we would like to walk you through the other social services and the environment protection program. And the last one is that what should be the next phase plan in the near future that we are going to support or we are going to do with this community enterprise. Let me begin with the first one. This community enterprise called Lamsai Patana, because that's the originally name of that area. The structure is uh, come from all of the farmer, the local villager who doing the uh, doing rest and do uh, the culture of the catfish. But because of the price of the fish is struggling very, very low. So they are comprising all the wisdom of the villager nearby all together. And they come out and try to produce and do the self-processing uh, catfish all together. Then come the year of uh, starting this enterprise as the 2017, back then, the Provincial Agriculture Office from the Department of the Agriculture Promotion is helping them to be able to legally and establishing this Lamsai Patana Community Enterprise. So let's say they have been started from the first day altogether back in October, I'm sorry, the May 2017. And then there are, uh, a lot of uh, structure inside and all the um, development in production, processing, marketing, or even the product starts to get the primary GMP from the Department of the Fishery to be able to start initially develop the product. Then come the group and the management. This community enterprise formed the management originally with their own funding. All the private funding is come from each and every single of the member and they try to helping to maintain the stock at, as well as um, uh, balance the price. Try to raise the stock from the member, make sure that the pond and the funding uh, from the capital of the fish food and the procurement is all balanced. And the group has all this development and concern and adjusting over and over a year. And after that, they come up with this um, seven person with uh, originally is a 500 baht per share. And uh, in 2020, all the member resolve and um, get a loan from the Bank of the Agriculture and the Agriculture Cooperatives that helping them to be able to put them into a much more faster pace to do that product. So here comes the next page. Okay, the number, the number is kind of very interesting. From the, the number of this, uh, there are uh, two major group. The first one is comprising with the uh, catfish farmer, which is a very large group, but today's session, we would like to address to the second group of the catfish processing people comprising with only 18 people. 10 is a male, they are all male, and eight is a very key person as a female. And these female and male has been worked all together to be able to do all the um, cooking, uh, packing, or uh, suggesting the in-house in recipe and the product to be able to just win, not just win, but they all win together as a provincial and the regional Women's Award. They have been working tediously from the um, left hand side of this uh, presentation. They have this seminar, they have the group brainstorming, they have the group um, thinking of the product, or even just try to sort out like what should they do with each and every piece of the fish all together. So basically, this is the background that they all coming up all together. And what is this, um, all this? all done together. Let's see from the next agenda. The second agenda is the main accountability and the task action and the activity. Yes, um, with the fixed crop of 
each year. They can do up to only three cops per year. And all of them has been working all together into three main phases. The first one is they are focusing basically on the upstream that they need rely on the 10 mil to doing all the um, pawns work and all the waving to be able to raise the price. And when it's come to the second part, which is the mi midstream, they all have this expanding people at the food processing plant and come up with this major first product, which is the ready to cook. The first one is the, the first ever is the semi-dry aged catfish. It is uh, very ready to cook and packing and ready to serve. And they are come up with the second product, which is a very locally product known national wide as a fermented dried fish. Here locally, we don't actually call it a fermented dried fish, but we, it, it is well known as blossom. So they come up with this brilliant idea of this two ready to cook. And the ready to eat is come up after, very popular. The original one is the fried catfish stripe, which is has a bit salty. And they come up with the second one, the ready to eat is the sweet one. It is a very um, popular in Thai market because people majorly love to eat all everything sweet. And it's come with the crispy fry skin cook in a very tasty paprika, which is a very chili and tasty salt. And the last product that come as a winner that become very, very popular is the crispy fish chip. I will walk you through the crispy fish chip about all the details later on in the presentation. But um, after they have come up with this uh, full product of the ready to cook, I'm sorry, ready to eat and ready to cook too, there are leftover, the fat belly, the bone and everything. They're just making some oil or they making the bio fermentation of the right fish and sell it back to the community to make some money and to make sure that the environment is safe as well. And the last but not least is the head of the fish itself. They just like put it back on a pond and do the culture pond and feeding back to the variety of the fish in that. So basically from the upstream headmanship, all these female comprised together, come up with a genius tasteful product, ready to cook, ready to eat. And the last one, they put it into the market or even go to the exhibition by department of the, the fishery support or even with the local um, one tambon, one product kind of exhibition that because of the pandemic, we need to stop all this activity, but it is very well known even before the pandemic hit, hit us. So basically, this is uh, in the three phase that we do this uh, accountability action and activity. Let me walk through more detail of the product in the next topic. The third one is that I just want to highlight again how the product look and how tasteful it is. The first one on the left uh, side corner, the upper one is the semi dry aged catfish and the striped um, fish in the salty or even in the sweet one or even the blossom and the crispy skin is on the left hand side. At the same time, on the right hand side, you can see two color of the packaging, the orangey one, the tangerine one on the top and the navy one is on the bottom. It shows how the product has been developed and has been um, getting the support from the Department of the Fishery and all the official to be able to put this product into the market. And on the lower table that you can see, that is the product that is on the process. Just try to get all everything certified, all to get Thai FDA, all to get into the right proper product to deliver. It's include of the Chinese fish sauces, Northern Saiwa sauces, and the smoked fish sauces. And the last but not least is a spicy fish cake. You will see more of this product on the very last page that I would like to introduce it to you. This page is very impressive and very interesting. In terms of the far right corner, you see the crispy fish chip itself. This is the flavor that we are selling now. Or even the very interesting local retail would like to have this like on the shelf. So basically, currently, we do have the social media on the Facebook and the Shopee supporting to do all the channel 
selling. At the same time, at this Department of the Fishery, they have both online and offline. The online has been going on for up to two years, and the offline, the um, mini mart is going coming up soon. That is how it looks, and this product going to be on shelf and offer to the rest of the people. But at the same time, we not only rely on the Facebook, Shopee, or the online only. Uh, at the community enterprise as well, we use a very common line application. We do the pre-order in every single of the product and we do the um, in-house preparation on the next day or sometimes the product is available. But the delivery is currently within two days, three days, the um, customer will get it right away. And the most popular product now that we are selling is on the right hand side is the crispy fish chip on the orange packaging that now we need to be able to come up with a reasonable and profitable retail price. Speaking of the income, the income is not coming into the absolute bar in terms of we are trying to presenting. We would like to address that the first two years that I mentioned that from 2018 and 2019 that they have their private fund and self-funding. They're not making any that much of the defining definite number of the income. But once they got a bank support, the loan and everything, they have a very prominent and fixed number like 80% income is coming from the freshwater fish um, trading and the rest 20% is divided equally from the enterprise income itself and the selling of the product. And because of last year and these last two years that we are hitting all fully by the pandemic. So the plan that we want to sell more of the finished products to, to the retail can make it possible within this year, by the second half of this year, that we plan that we want to raise a double from 10 year, 10% last year to 20% this year. And we're gonna double next year to 40% of all the income. And of course, the community cannot do it by themselves. They got a support unit and they got a very depart major department aspect supporting them. Majorly, they got a ward, they got a new packaging, um, they got a very fabulous food innovation and the product development from um, the Department of uh, Fishery to do the uh, to get a GAP. And of course, to verify the process of the Thai FDA, they need to go through and a very um, big support from the provincial agriculture from the Patuntani province. And the last one is the project packaging design that is, we are proud to say that it's, it's compete um, domestically or even internationally from Lachamankala University of Technology at the Tanyaburi Kongbok campus. The fishery and the agriculture have, has been adjusting all the farming develop and then putting in this packaging from the year 2021 up until 2020. And the social service that we need to um, emphasize the public interest is the, the funeral as we are very religious uh, company we do supporting every single support for the funeral service in the area. And then each and the member, uh, we have these students, their activity, even we have this severe pandemic hit and the community service as well. We maintain, they maintain the merit of the two temple in the area and the canteen twice a year. For the aspect of the environment care, all the whole pitch separately sold, they're not, become not even a single one become environmentally burden at all. Because then in a waterway, we just put everything back into the pond and the pond is not, we on, not only have the catfish, we have a variety of the fish in that pond as well. And definitely the waterways never, never ever in a single, single day or a single time that they release this back into the natural water resource. So basically this fish farming and the process of the product of the Lamsai Patana community enterprise is in accordance to the BCG model, each and every single. And the last one we would like to um, emphasize on the locally um, product like the Northern, the Northeastern, or even the sausage. 
to be able to catch different size of uh, a customer, um, the province, the area, the demographic, or even the crispy fish ship that we are very proud of and it's become very good. We have this under development into a very much more flavor as well. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for our time. And that will be all for the presentation from Lam Sai Patana. Thank you very much. Swalika. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kantana, Ms. Nam Oi, and our colleagues uh, from DOF Thailand for that inspiring example. Our next speaker is Somone, Somoni Ate, who will tell us about rice fish farming for food security, nutrition, and biodiversity. So Moni, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Susan. And I think uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, make a presentation on the rice fish farming for food security, nutrition, and biodiversity for the International Year of Additional Fishery and Aquaculture 2022. So celebrating of small scale fishery and aquaculture in Asia. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be able to share with you some of thought that on our initiative in Cambodia that we have been doing and trying to promote our small scale. Yeah. Can okay, so I'm going to uh, present three uh, uh, attempt that we are trying to uh, uh, work with the rural farmers and in time we want to increase their uh, production and also revenue and income as well. And also that one of the models is enhancing economic gain in rice integrated agriculture by increasing average efficiency and including high value prawn. And the second one is the ecological intensification of rice crop system to a more diverse and productive rice agriculture system. And then the, the, the third one, uh, uh, we, we, I talked about the development of rice field agriculture at the irrigation, that this is also a new initiative that we try to use the water irrigation available on it, not only for rice, but also to integrate with fish farming as well. So uh, the first one is uh, our approach. And so as you can see there, our intervention, we want to introduce the uh, macrobrachium in uh, culture in the rice field system. So by uh, having some uh, compensation of the uh, rice field for the canals uh, surrounding or uh, as one part of the rice field, by around 30 to 40% of the total rice field, being used for the uh, as a canal for the or uh, as a pond and that are connect, connected to the rice field for the uh, macrobrachium culture. But of course, this involves uh, 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 rice field preparation and green water uh, uh, preparation and also prevention of the air yeah, of the pest of the uh, yeah the, the pest the the carnivores uh, species in the uh, surrounding right, uh, rice field area. So uh, there are some challenge after we conducted the first uh, cycle, the first year cycle. So this is one we learned after four months stocking. So when the farmers, uh, uh, you know, they have problem with the water level uh, uh, drop uh, shortages, and then and then also this is resulting irregular molting. You can see on the pictures that uh, they not cannot mold and the, the the color become. Uh, not pleasant and, and then algae on the shelf. And then also this is not very good for selling and the price will be dropping. So what we can learn from, so the next cycle we plan for that, uh, for a, a culture cycle of four months. So we, during this time, they are doing very well, so we can have it. So, and then additional water, uh, additional water cost mass mortality in one pilot, because I think probably of the toxic water they're using. And then, what we learn also from this, to keep reservoir in the in the farm area is so important because you can control when you have your own water there, yeah, you can control and you can do the water exchange. So you, uh, you're doing like uh, low tide and high tide when you uh, are regularly uh, adding water uh, once a week or two, uh, two, two, two weeks one time. So this simulate the molting and then also 
the the central voting of the microfracture. So the result, preliminary result, is quite uh, quite good. Or those uh, the survival rate we receive is nearly fifty percent survival rate, and uh, it's not as we expected around 60, 65 percent. But uh, I think uh, the 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 result of the income uh, the revenue uh, quite good compared to only doing only rice but integrated with macro production I think uh, uh, farmers are very happy in our our, our model farmer are restarting uh, expanding their own uh, rice field uh, integrated with the rice and then they are expanding two more hectares for their uh, macro production integrated this by farmer. <laughs> So, so the, you can see that uh, this uh, the harvest of the macro production, and then they are well uh, accepted by the by the market, by the by the consumer, and they and then they happy, and because they they are very fresh and, and tasty, and then they they sold very well, and uh, and also the neighboring farmers started to adopt the innovation as well from this uh, our research initiative with the farmers. So number uh, number two, and my second one is talking about this is important that uh, we try to uh, intensify the ecological ecological area for the rice crop system to a more diverse and productive rice agriculture system. So uh, the you see the current practices they 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 don't do that much. They only do the wet rice, uh, wet season rice, and local variety. But our proposal and we we doing this is we introduce fish culture coming perch in March to uh, May, so three months we can harvest it. And then uh, in the wet season, we can uh, stop also the silver bar and with uh, uh, some wild population traps, some selected wild population as well. And uh, this uh, will increase the productivity of the rice, uh, uh, rice field ecosystem and so increase the revenue of the farmers as well and also increase the uh, fish, uh, wild fish diversity and biodiversity as well in in in, in this area. To somehow there are, there are some uh, we observe that there are those uh, in the rural, rural area of Cambodia. There are still there are different high of soil that can affect the uh, uh, the sustainability of integrating with the uh, fish uh, culture in the rice field system. You see, the uh, uh, canals are almost dry and then. A little water in the refuse and we, we dig the pond and then uh, the turbid water after rain as you can see that so the uh, this high variable high variable uh, soil quality of on the water level in the pond the seepage and the fertilization effect overall production of and visibility of the practice of aquaculture in the dry system so we conclude that the dry season aquaculture only feasible in pond with suitable soil. So this you can see the climbing perch harvest and then the, some uh, compost or fertilization, uh, fertilization, and then with good fertilization, a good uh, effect, good yield was possible. Yeah, in the harvest. So among our initiative, the uh, the total. 11 pond, we got five optimum and one best result. We received one best result. So, and then we catch some still catch some wild fish. The snake is there, although it's a uh, culture that uh, climbing perch is a uh, hatchery uh, 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 species, hatchery fingerling. So, here what uh, we learned from uh, silver bar was stop. And then uh, production was relied on fertilization. That's what we say. And then this is using local availability, availability resources. And then, and so especially grow rate during the mid cycle was optimum. Sometimes they have this uh, kind of disease uh, uh, symptom, the ulcer, and happening, uh, especially after the winter time. And uh, selected inclusion of wild species uh, led to high fish diversity of the. Uh, See, we saw that 20 species from the wild species that uh, quite a diverse uh, species into this uh, rice field system. And then last one I like to share with you, this is also uh, an interesting that we try to integrate aquaculture in at the irrigation uh, program. So this is what part of the 
big priority, water resource management and agroecological transition for Cambodia, wait for come. So this is the, the outline that I'm going to talk about. And then the, you see the, what uh, we're going to do is the component four, the support innovative farming practice and support to rice value chain, agroecological practice, crop diversification and rice field aquaculture. So this is the, the four provinces, uh, the five provinces that uh, the project is uh, working with. So the rice is farming, this increased the area available for fish production for all rice farmers and food security increased. Large irrigated area available in the water camp project area. Fish is some insect and then bit and then there are harmful to the rice plant. And this reduced cost of pesticide and insecticide and is good for the environment. So reduced cost of the fertilizer and farmers do not have to spend time of, uh, searching for fish feed reduction of cost for feeding and net profit is higher. And production rice yield increased uh, from 10 to 20 percent compared to the rice yield without integration of fish or prawn. Provide good economic value per unit and per crop compared to rice cultivation alone and optimal, uh, optimize the rice organic and integrated pest management production. So raising fish two times per year in irrigation scheme. So they have plenty of water because of the, in the irrigation uh, scheme access to water and to refresh water, uh, to refresh the pond from canal, provide good economic value, integrate dye cropping. That's important another area that we did also with macro program because uh, we raised the dye. And then we also integrated with the uh, coconut, the aroma of coconut that, that, and that uh, also have a good value, a high value and good demand uh, from, from the market as well. <laughs> So that uh, the demonstration that you can see that the uh, and rice field, we uh, use the red tilapia, uh, like those gaster, the, and then the several bar and catfish and farm just to see the, the, the rice fish farming that uh, the one over rice, rice, rice fish farming was already harvested and then and while this is the second one will be harvested in April 2022. And we have another uh, fish pond and aquaculture as well. You can see on in, in the pictures, and then they also do the frog farming as well. And that and Azola is uh, our work by uh, program. And then this in Simrip, and perhaps here in Simrip, though they have uh, and uh, they have a uh, similar uh, rice fish farming and fish pond aquaculture, and uh, also the same in Simrip and Azola. And then uh, this is what they you can see that uh, from this Mr. Shuksa, so uh, in Batambong province, so after they, they integrated with Azola, with the cropping system uh, in uh, on the dike, so they can get a, a plant, they can fish, get and have fish. So this is a, uh, so not only increasing the food nutrition and, and revenue, and also revenue, it's also they increase the food protein supply in the family, also we can sell the fish, sell the fish to market as well, and improve the rice field. Uh, ecology, so not using to uh, over using the pesticide or put the, uh, over put the, uh, fertilizer in the uh, rice system. So the after six one uh, result, so only one thousand square meter. So you can see they get the gross margin uh, two hundred seventy two dollars. So I think it's it's quite uh, quite good compared to there's only one thousand square meter uh, uh, in a pond area in uh, with the rice field system. If they can uh, use more of the rice, uh, rice field area, so I think they can increase the revenue, the, 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 the revenue, and then the, also the profit as well. So they we work closely with the, our department, uh, aquaculture development, and then the, our fish administration working with this uh, Niras company that who doing this uh, work for uh, for camp for the component four. So we have uh, our team that work hand in hand and provide the technical uh, uh, advice and also including build, building the local nursery and hatchery in the, those provinces to ensure they have access to the good quality of uh, fingerling of uh, different species and then they, they can also get good survival of the fingerling in the area. Yeah. So we also are writing the feeding uh, as well for the um, feeding management of the uh, 
the, uh, in the, to the farmers, yeah, and how to dig the pond and the canal in the rice field, and how to improve fish uh, pond or water quality that uh, to be green, and then also skin how to screen fish pond and canal properly in order to uh, get high survival rate of stop fingerling. So this day, I mean, this day our colleague visiting uh, the farmer and advising and then uh, and interacting with the farmers. So I'd like to express my uh, uh, sincere thanks to our partners for good collaboration and support of rice fish farming and for food security, nutrition and biodiversity in Cambodia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sumoni, for that uh, very interesting and uh, illuminating presentation. We move on now to our next presenter, who is uh, Ben Belton, and he will tell us about small-scale aquaculture and its diversity in Asia. Ben, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you see the screen okay? Yes, it's fine. Okay, so... Uh... I'd like to thank the organizers, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to talk about what's one of my favorite subjects, uh, small scale aquaculture and its diversity in Asia. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions of uh, colleagues and friends, Peter Edwards, Wen Bajang, Mafuz Or Hock, and David Little, who all have um, contributed uh, photographs, but more importantly, perhaps have contributed to a lot of the ideas that go into this presentation as well. Uh, through our work together. Okay, so the outline is, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call here traditional small-scale aquaculture, uh, and then more specialized forms of small-scale uh, aquaculture, um, and then integration, which is a common um, theme across many different types. And then I'm going to go through some of the varieties of different uh, technologies, that are found in different environments. Um, to talk a little bit about value chains and employment and food and nutrition security, and then conclude. So this is what maybe many people have in mind when they when they think of small scale aquaculture. And you can see here in Bangladesh, Nepal, Timor Leste, and Cambodia, um, very small ponds. And this is sort of uh, what what was thought of in the past also as, as being called rural aquaculture. So what, what are the characteristics of this type of traditional small scale aquaculture? Well, um, it's concentrated mainly in rural areas, but it tends to be quite scattered. So maybe each village has a few ponds here and there. Um, the ponds, as you saw in the last pictures, tend to be very small. So uh, less than 0.2 hectares down to a, a few square meters even. Um, these tend to be multi-use water bodies, as you can see from the picture on the left. So Often the ponds are constructed for harvesting drinking water, used for washing, bathing, watering livestock, irrigation, and so on. So fish culture or aquaculture, not necessarily the primary purpose. Um, in terms of the fish, uh, they're, they're very often polycultures of what you might call traditional species, so carps, tilapia. Um, and as we saw in the last presentation, actually very often there are unstocked fish that come into the ponds as well and, and are harvested. Um, so these are typically quite low input systems, um, not very much use of uh, formulated feeds, although that's increasing, um, maybe irregular feeding. And so they're set extensive to semi-intensive and they have quite low yields. Um, because they're very small, they're mainly managed using only family labor. And so the levels of investment, but also the returns are fairly low and as a result they tend to be one component of livelihoods among many so typically people with these kind of ponds will also be farming they'll also be engaged in off-farm work so it's a complementary activity as part of this wider livelihood portfolio um, and very often the, the fish are for home consumption but also there are surpluses generated that are sold into local markets so moving now to uh, what I'm calling here more specialized forms of small scale aquaculture. You can see a variety here. We have tilapia in Thailand, walking catfish in Indonesia, crayfish in China, carp in India, but there are many, many more. Um, and a few commonalities. One is, as you can see in the pictures on the left, uh, the use of pelleted feeds. 
um, and also, as you can see, uh, going up to quite high levels of intensity. Um, also, a greater diversity of species than are, than are grown in the more traditional ponds. Uh, and you can observe also that the ponds are well constructed. They have high dikes, they're a regular shape. So they've been constructed specifically for use in fish culture. Um, so this has been one of the most rapidly growing segments of, of aquaculture in Asia over about the past 30 years. Um, and the fish that's coming out of these specialized systems is produced very largely for, for sale to the market. And so the growth of demand from uh, domestic markets in Asia has really driven the growth of the sector. Um, very often these types of farms are appearing in clusters. So uh, there, will, there will be lots of farms in, in one particular area. Uh, those could be rural areas, often also in peri-urban areas on the outskirts of large cities. Um, so the farms range from uh, really quite small, maybe 0.2 hectares up to perhaps 10 hectares, so kind of a, a, a range of small to medium sizes. Um, as we said, they tend to be purpose-built ponds. They're used only for, for aquaculture. Very often they're polycultures, but for some um, species that are raised more intensively, so catfishes perhaps, uh, you know, they can be monocultures too. Um, and we see a, a variety of species, carp, tilapia, catfish, but also uh, a whole range of what you might call niche, uh, higher value species. Um, so the input use tends to range from, from intermediate to quite high, so from semi-intensive to intensive. Um, often agricultural processing byproducts such as rice bran are used, uh, but increasingly, and in, in many of these ponds, as we saw in the last picture, also use of formulated feeds to, to varying extents. Um, so these are family owned and operated, but very often hiring uh, in hired labor, uh, as you can see in the, in the illustrated in the picture here. Um, and the level of investment uh, and operating costs is, tends to be moderate through to quite high, but also the returns kind of range from, from moderate to potentially quite high. Um, as a result, this tends to, to be a major component of the livelihoods of, of people or households who are, who are practicing this. Um, and most of the production is going into domestic value chains, particularly for urban markets, but there are also uh, a number of uh, products produced for export. So a, a common feature of a lot of uh, small scale aquaculture is that there's some degree of integration. So you can see on the left, a, a picture of sort of maybe the classic uh, kind of aquaculture integration, uh, rice fish here in Bangladesh. Um, but another very common one is, is chicken fish, illustrated here from Myanmar. And we have a shot of the, the VAC system in Vietnam where you have livestock, so ducks or pigs uh, over the pond, the, the nutrients from the manure going into the pond, fertilizing it, feeding the fish. The fish are also fed uh, feed and then the water is used to irrigate these intensive crops on the, on the dikes. Um, and then finally on the right, you have a ditch dike system in Thailand. So these are common in delta areas where soil is excavated to build raised beds to, ra to, to grow fruit or vegetables and then fish uh, are grown in the canals. So really there's a whole diversity of, of forms of irrigation uh, integration. Uh, the ones that we've looked at are, are direct integration. So rice fish, rice crustacean is another one as we, as we just saw in the last presentation. This is very common uh, in Southwest Bangladesh, for instance, with uh, freshwater prawns and rice, but also in China with, with crayfish, with, with mitten crabs integrated with rice. Um, there's a range of different uh, kinds of livestock. So chickens, pigs, ducks being some of the most common that are integrated with fish and many different fruits, vegetables, nuts. So for instance, coconuts, very common in some places. And all of these can be combined in, in different combinations. Um, but as we see on the, the left-hand picture, there's also indirect integration through the use of agricultural byproducts and, and processing waste that are coming from off farm. So things like rice bran, oil cake, chicken manure, and they're used as inputs or feeds for the pond. And so, this kind of reuse of, of waste is very often described now as in terms of a circular economy, but this has really been going on and has been a crucial 
uh, part of, of aquaculture in Asia for a very long time. So things that drive integration, partly at a source of cheap inputs, also it's more efficient to use land to grow multiple crops, um, and also it's efficient to recycle nutrients am amongst different crops. Um, it allows spreading of risk across multiple crops. So for instance, if you have a bad uh, a crop of chickens, maybe you can still make money back off the, the fish that you harvest. Um, and it smooths out seasonal variations in income because there are different crops that can be harvested regularly or at different times of year. Um, so I've been talking primarily about ponds in, in the first few slides. So I'm now gonna move on and talk about a whole range of other technologies in, in different environments. So we have three examples on the left of different types of cage culture. So Pangasius is grown in a river in Cambodia, red tilapia in cages in a canal in Thailand, and then tilapia cages in Lake Tal in the Philippines. Um, on the right, we have a really, really important uh, aquaculture crop for the region that's very often sort of overlooked or forgotten about. So this is water spinach being grown in a canal in Thailand. It's also grown in converted rice fields and very often using wastewater uh, from the city. So that's another kind of in integration in a way. Um, here are some examples of coastal aquaculture. So the most uh, sort of dominant one being shrimp, which you can see on the left. Um, these are uh, extensive shrimp ponds, but it's not only fish that's being produced, sorry, shrimp that's being produced. There's a whole variety of shrimp and other crustaceans. Some of them are stocked, some of them are wild seed that gets into the ponds. Um, and you can see from the, the damage to the tree, uh, some of the environmental problems associated with this form of farming and sal salinization uh, here in this case. Um, we have a somewhat similar system in the, in the Philippines. This one is used to grow milkfish, but again, many other kinds of stocked and unstocked uh, uh, crustaceans and fish getting into these systems. Um, the next one is a soft sh shelled crab farm in Bangladesh. And in this case, the crablets are actually harvested from the wild and then, then fattened up until they shed their shells. So another sort of link to wild seed. Um, and on, on the right hand side, we have a very intensive Vanamai pond in Indonesia. So even within shrimp aquaculture and even within a single country, there's a very wide range of, of types of uh, system quite often. Um, so this is some pictures of marine aquaculture. We have marine fish cages in Malaysia here um, being used to grow high value species such as red snapper, which go into local markets, but also exported to places like Hong Kong. You can see trash fish being fed here, but oftentimes also pelleted feeds being used. Um, we have mussels from Thailand. These have been growing on a, growing on a suspended raft, but mussels, oysters, and so on, are very common in, in Thailand, Vietnam, China, uh, and also huge quantities of seedweed being, being produced in China, Indonesia, Philippines, and, and, uh, and places like Timor Leste, as you can see on the right. Um, also sometimes somewhat forgotten in discussions of small scale aquaculture are hatcheries and nurseries, which are uh, oftentimes quite small businesses. So you can see carp and tilapia hatcheries here um, and pangasius and carp nurseries in, in Vietnam and India. Um, and oftentimes uh, actually in some places there can be very large numbers of, of small nurseries that can be even more numerous than grow out farms. Uh, so we could really have had a whole uh, presentation that was just photographs of people working in aquaculture value chains downstream or upstream of the farm, but so I just had to select four pictures here to illustrate some of the diversity of, of those roles. Um, so on the left hand side, th this woman is being paid to uh, take the meat out of snails that are going to be used and then that that's going to be used as prawn feed in, in Bangladesh. And then you can see in the next slide, um, very often large numbers of people involved in the transport of feed and other inputs to and from uh, markets and farms, lots of people employed in, in harvesting. Um, and then again on the right side to emphasize the importance of transport businesses, uh, this, this man has his own truck and he rents it out uh, to retailers who come to collect fish at the central wholesale market in, in Yangon. Um, so this is just to sort of illustrate that where we have these dense clusters of small scale aquaculture forming um, 
particularly the specialized kind, then there's a whole range, a whole sort of ecosystem of uh, different economic opportunities and specialized activities that are created. Um, so moving on now, just to illustrate uh, the links to food and nutrition security. Um, on the left, we have a harvest of, of stocked fish and unstocked small indigenous fish species that have come out of a, a rice fish system in Bangladesh. And these are going to be eaten directly by the, the household themselves. Uh, then we have a picture of a fish market in Cambodia. So this woman is selling paku that have come out of a, a, a pond nearby, uh, sort of a, a, a cheap fish it's sold in fresh form. Then we have in Thailand, these fried tilapia, so they've been processed, but again, again, available very cheaply. And then finally on the right, these are the, the fried heads of freshwater prawns. So the freshwater prawn are a high value product. The bodies are sent to Europe, but the heads remain locally and that they're sold as a, a tasty and, and nutritious snack. So to summarize, um, small scale aquaculture in Asia, as we've seen, is highly diverse and that diverse towards intensification, uh, very wide use of inform uh, formulated feeds now and some more sophisticated technologies but extensive and semi-intensive systems remain effective in, in many contexts and actually uh, quite persistent. Um, we see uh, increasing diversification into new niche species. So many of the sort of traditional aquaculture species, carps, tilapias, some catfish, um, are now produced in very large quantities. The, 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 the price is very low, which is good, as we heard in the first presentation, actually. So this is really good for consumers not so good for farmers. So this is sort of driving a constant search for, for new species to, to try out. Um, and also we see the emergence of some, what you might call boutique technologies, RAS, raceways in ponds, aquaponics, and so on, under certain circumstances. Um, so small scale aquaculture fulfills a wide range of roles in producer livelihood. So it can be something that's quite small, but complementary to the other activities that the household has going on, or it can be something really central to um, everything that the household does, depending on how much they, ha they have invested and, and so on. Um, and as we've seen, it can create a really wide, wide range of uh, employment opportunities, both, both on the farm for hired workers uh, and off farm in value chains uh, that emerge around clusters of these, these specialized farms. Um, and then finally, as we all know, it's a very important contributor to food and nutrition security in the region um, through this supply of affordable aquatic foods that this, this growth uh, of aquaculture has allowed, foods such as this, this water spinach, as you can see here, in this photograph on the left. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for the comprehensive and fascinating uh, presentation. At this stage, we would like to show you the e photo book being developed by InfoFish under a letter of agreement with FAO. And uh, this will be presented uh, through a video. And then after the this, video this presentation, spinach, as you can see here, in this photograph on the left. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry, Ben. Yeah, so uh, I as I was saying, um, we will be presenting the video on the uh, e-photo book. And after that, we will have the Q and we will open the floor for the question and answer for the speakers. And uh, so thank you very much, Ben, for that uh, uh, fascinating and comprehensive presentation. And I would like to ask uh, InfoFish colleagues to show us uh, the video on the e-photo book.
Thank you very much, uh, InfoFish colleagues. We hope you enjoy the video. Uh, just to let you know that the e-photo book is being finalized for publication, and we will share the link uh, to download the publication in the landing page of the IAFA webinars and in the IAFA website. So it is time for some uh, question and answer. But before I uh, post uh, the question to our panelists, I would like to uh, ask Sherleen first to clarify some uh, things uh, about a certificate uh, of attendance. Uh, Sherleen, over to you. Thanks, Susanna. I'm not sure if you can hear, it's raining heavily over here. Um, yeah, I think there are some couple of uh, requests for certificates for this webinar. Unfortunately, uh, we are not distributing any certificates uh, for this webinar. And also the presentations uh, that have been uh, made today and for tomorrow, we will get the, um, the go ahead from the presenters before we have them available from at the website, for the landing page. But the recording, uh, Sherlene, what about the recording? The recording will be available on the landing page and on InfoFish YouTube channel. Thank you, Sherlene. So uh, let us have uh, uh, some questions. And uh, let's start off with uh, a question for both uh, Ben and uh, Somoni. And um, you showed us about the di uh, diversity of small-scale uh, uh, aquaculture in Asia. Somoni uh, told us about the um, rice uh, fish farming. And um, what what would be the potential uh, impacts of climate change on on this uh, on this type of uh, activities, and 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 how do you think the farmers would be able to to uh, adapt? What would be needed uh, uh, for this? So, whom do we? Maybe I I could call on uh, Ben Ben first, and then uh, Moni after. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. That's, a, that's interesting question. So what are the likely impacts of climate change uh, on these sort of integrated rice fish systems in particular? Um, so, I mean, we're going to see more frequent extreme weather events and less predictable weather, essentially. So that means more likelihood of drought. It means higher likelihood of flooding. Um, and very likely it means higher temperatures, so higher water temperatures. Um, and actually for some recent survey work that we've done in, in, in the southwest Bangladesh, we see a very high incidence of, of farmers reporting that they've made losses um, within the, the last five years, um, some of them on multiple occasions, um, due particularly to flooding, but, but occasionally drought. Um, and so they're adapting as, as best they can. Um, sometimes it means changes in salinity as well, if you're in sort of a more coastal environment. So that may, may mean shifting between species. Um, people may change the time at which they're stocking. Um, very often they're um, building higher dikes uh, or sometimes putting up fencing to, to uh, prevent fish escaping. Um, they might be deepening the, the ponds as well. Often the ponds are very shallow. So trying to, to make them deeper so that they're, they're not um, sort of as affected by these extremes of temperature. Um, so those are some of the immediate sort of um, impacts and adaptations that people might be following. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, Moni? Thank you, Susan. And I think Ben already uh explain and respond to uh, the question by Susan. I think I just to uh, uh, bring in another angle that um, yes, of course, climate change is going to be there. But uh, at the same time, you see in the in the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the, the price uh, of the fertilizers and the transportation costs become very expensive. So uh, no matter what uh, the, the farmer, rice farmer are facing big problem in uh, getting profit over their rice farming production. And our goal from our point of view 
changing the bad, uh, not the, the not the good practices doing uh, three times of rice per year is is in the long run is not going to help the ecosystem as well. So it's going to uh, so our attempt is to demonstrate to work with the farmers, with the model farmer or innovative farmer that you can change, you can you can innovate your system by uh, integrating with the fish or and uh, maybe not all farmers having the a resource capacity to do what we think is good, even those is, is they have a location good and then and then but the resource is not there. Even they sometimes the in the, the I think the intellectual resource is also not there. It's not easy to work with that farmer. So uh, we call a uh, financial resource and intellectual resources and the industrialness of the farmers itself is the key for our success to do the intervention. And then we need to uh, properly select the, those farmer who have uh you know a kind of resilient and adapt to the, the condition and then willing to to apply new uh, to, to take risks and to do a uh, uh, new approach with us and that's that's the key i think and then so i think from that if they have the resources they can do i think uh, year by year it's going to be most of the time you'll be facing with the water shortages drought so i think the better they have this this would have uh, as I mentioned, this this would have the reservoir in their uh, their, their uh, rice area. That's important because they are not only for the rice, not only for the fish, but for the crops, uh, some uh, some some fruit tree as well. So they need to integrate from now on, uh, you know, to uh, doing on the rice alone. So, but this all in all requires somebody, a farmer, who are really, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, really wanted to. to take risks and want to change, you know, so they have uh, the resources available and both the uh, financial resources and also the intellectual resources they have. So I think no matter what, they, they have to live with the, the change and then of course the species that you are providing them, uh, you are they're going to do it. So if they have less water, they need to reduce uh, 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 like the species that can grow faster in the short time, and then they can have less. So that also at the same time, there are another model of the small scale agriculture during the COVID-19 situation. I think every, most uh, part of the world, a lot of newcomer uh, because they 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 not they cannot do a lot of traveling. They stay home. Then they look at the YouTube. They look at the internet, and then they see the uh, this uh, rice uh, the, the fish farming, small scale fish farming in plastic tent. Uh, so a lot of this now, uh, even the young people, the uh, youth group also in. So, uh, so the divers have even even have not covered that. That I think we can cover this uh, new uh, dimension of the young young youth group that they are into the aquaculture without even studying the aquaculture field or fisheries field. But they learn don't... from YouTube, from 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 the neighboring, from others through so because of the internet accessibility, they can contact, they can interact through through YouTube or through Facebook, so they can ask interact together. But at the same time, we see also there are some fraud. You know, there are somebody selling that everything they can do is they can be successful, everything. So also there's a, a, a problem as well that that's why we are monitoring, try to see those uh, uh, those selling the you know just the selling the their their the bad practices and then uh, making the new farmer new new the newcomer. They they going to fail if they don't have a basic understanding of the. Uh, aquacultures are farming, so so they didn't want to fail if they, they they believe on what they are uh, over or uh, you know over talking on what they are doing. So that's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Moni. And now we go to Miss Akantana and Miss Nam Oi, and uh, we have actually a, a question here from a colleague. Uh, what are the prospects of marketing the products from Thailand uh, internationally? Okay, I will do the translation. The um, before we go internationally, we are currently because of the pandemic, we don't have much of the product pushing from the enterprise into the uh, product in general. So the first step is we are stepping in the much more variety into the traditional and non-traditional. And internationally, internationally, we would hope that we will have a very solid plan to go with the crispy rice and. Uh, we try to um, participate and maintain all the roadshow if it's available and secure. 
after this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much um, to both of you. There's another uh, question here. Ah, okay. Another question from our colleague, and this is to Ben. Is there any legal definition? Uh, hold on a second. I just want to make this uh, clear. Is there any legal definition of small scale aquaculture? This is to Ben. <laughs> um, thank you. So um, I guess that if, if there is, it would vary from, from place to place, right? I, I can't um, off the top of my head think of a country that has a, a legal definition of what, what constitutes small scale aquaculture. But that's not to say that it doesn't exist. Um, I don't know if anyone else on, on this call um, in, in this meeting can, can think of an example, but um, I'm, I'm not aware of one uh, offhand. Thanks for that, Ben. So the next question is actually for Sumoni, but uh, the attendee says, thank you to all presenters. Sumoni mentioned that successful fish farm demonstrations encourage others to shift to integrated farming systems as well. What are other positive drivers to behavior change and climate adaptation observed in Asia and perhaps uniquely Asian have you encountered aside from this? Yeah, over to you, Moni. So yeah, what would encourage uh, behavior change? Um. So the the, the uh, uh, thank you for the question. I think it uh, you see what what we learn, what we observe, what we work with the farmers uh, through many field visits, and we see different uh, modality of farmer who are integrating and then learning and adapting to uh, the climate change. Mm -hmm. So I think, and also by involving. Um, uh, their, 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 their children uh, in the family during the COVID-19 situation, so most school not uh, open, so they start and they stay home and then they work uh, with the family there and then they can see, and then that can, they, that they can bring in the, the youth and uh, the children in, working together and on that farm, I think, from our support, from our project, so they learn more. So this is, I think, that new that we've been so most of our intervention before we always neglect, uh, neglected the, the involvement and, and then of the, the youth and then the young people in the, uh, in the community. So if they, they, they are engaged in our activity with the parents and then, uh, and then this also what we want to demonstrate them that a one hectare of farm where you do only rice alone, you may not be able to uh, make anywhere to go. So you make nothing, and then in a bad year, not in a good rain, the rain coming late, or uh, not a, not a good pattern of rain, also affecting the rice production, and then, and then also so this so if they it can integrate with the fish, and then and then also start what it demands in, because we need to understand agroecological is called condition the soil type as well as important, so we we know that if that area is suitable for coconut, so the, um, and brew the dye and make the coconut investing uh, another four year, uh, four, four or five years later, they got income from the from the coconut as well. We know exactly this area is good for that. So as a, uh, as a outsider, as a advisors, we need to fully understanding the agroecological condition of that farmer and how they, how they can, how again, I can uh, use that condition to improve their economic productivity. I, I, I think I think if we, if one example we, we see, you know, when we told them at the start with the farmer, they over there all have their own thinking, no matter what, and we start with them. Only when they face the problem that they start, oh yes, you're talking, it's true. When you start in, even you are, you are the, you know, advisor and you go in there and you should have their own, your own water. They say, no, I have plenty of water. Don't worry, plenty of water. 
So now this year, then they realize and they, I need to have my own reservoir. I cannot depend on the reservoir, the, the, the water from the, from the canal. So I need to make sure I have my own reservoir to uh, supply to my rice fish, uh, rice fish pond or rice fish uh, prawn. So that's what they learn when they encounter. But when our advice is not always there, so they, they, we need to work hand in hand with them. And then, uh, of course, when they see the opportunity, even that's fine one, they are sometimes greedy. They, are, they want to do greedy. They want to do more immediately. So this is our advice to go step by step because they need to understand the uh, a business plan, the, 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 the income, the expenses. And then the, the, the sometimes they, the, but they, when they saw the profit, the success, they, they join to jump in, they, they look for it, but, but we need to also this to slow them down, to learn step by step, that's what I see. Thank you. Thank you, Moni. Uh, oops. Thank you, Moni. We have a question for our colleagues in Thai uh, DOF, uh, Thai DOF colleagues. Uh, and the question is, does DOF have plans to replicate the project in other parts of Thailand? Thai DOF, <laughs> over to you. Ms. Cantana, are you there? Yes, a moment, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, they have the potential of the group that have the same, that they can implement and replicate it. They are working on it. Okay, thank you. Another question for Ben from our colleague. Small scale aquaculture farmers are often seen as not causing negative effects to the environment. This is not always true. For example, concentrated clusters of cage farms in small bays. What is done or needs to be done to ensure that small farmers do not cause negative impacts and livelihoods are maintained? Over to you, Ben. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good, uh, good observation. Um, I guess there's, there's nothing magical about being small scale that means you're sort of exempt uh, from, from being implicated in some of these negative impacts in, under certain circumstances. So um, we saw a couple of examples in the, in the presentation, actually. So for very dense clusters of cages, uh, as, as the, the questioner alluded to, and also um, the shrimp farms in, in southwest Bangladesh, you can see the, the damage that had been done to the, the trees there through the salinization of the soil. Um, so I guess really these are these are kind of questions about governance and how do you um, sort of best manage um, the, the ways that people uh, uh, in, 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 interact with or impact uh, the environment around them. Um, and, you know, I guess in, in both of those examples, the, the cages and, and the shrimp ponds, uh, the development has kind of occurred in this um, sort of un, unchecked way um, and sort of led to, or, or sort of un, unplanned, unmanaged um, way. Um, and so once you're, once you're at that stage, it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to sort of um, sort of walk it back. Um, I know actually in several countries in, in China, uh, for instance, in Indonesia, um, there have actually been um, sort of much stricter regulations of, of cages in, in uh, inland water bodies that have been brought in to, to cope with some of these impacts. And um, so that has some negative impacts for the, the people who are doing the farming, but may be necessary in some cases for uh, to, to to protect the environment. So I think no no easy answers, unfortunately. Thank you, Ben. Uh, there's another question from for for our colleagues in Thai uh, DOF, and the question is about uh, the uh, enterprise. As far as I noticed, the products are mainly from catfish. Do you have other fish species? 
are you going to work with other fish species is the question. Over to you, colleagues. Yes, the answer, yes. There, the other species, um, they are doing this. Uh, and, and while you're there, there's another question. Small scale aquaculture in Thailand, this is also for the Thai DOF. Small scale aquaculture in Thailand can access loan from agri banks. Could you let me know the terms and conditions to apply for the loan? For example, how large is the farm to be able to access the loan and the loan duration and interest? If you have the information. Okay, um, I'm from the Batum Thani Provincial uh, Officer. And uh, we can uh, make a group of the small scale fish in the same species make a group and the group go to bank, the bank to get a loan in the low interest. And uh, there are many groups and uh, many species of the fish, such as the tilapia, pancasias, uh, uh, in the coastal, it's a uh, vanamai, something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have a question for Somoni. Somoni, another question for you. In rice fish farming, the water temperature is always high. How can we maintain the water temperature in rice fish farming? Uh, thank you, Susanna, for the question from our colleagues. I think um, so. That's why we uh, we try to have the canal or uh, the the ponds adjacent to the rice field. So there should be a deeper uh, part of the, the rice field system, rice right, fish system. So this allow in the really hot months. And then normally uh, what we do during the hot month is it's time to harvest. So not time to, to culture because the water availability becomes shorted in those uh, area. So that's why we try to stop in uh, early rainy season as we can. And then we have certain months, six months at least and then we, we can have our, our culture species uh, rich uh, marketable side. So during also the uh, uh, the early rainy season month, so the, uh, the the temperature, water temperature will not be much changing that much. All those we see that, and now it become hot and now even the rainy season, uh, the temperature, but the water the temperature will be not that much changing compared to the uh, dry season time. So. So that's why we recommend to uh, uh, sacrifice 30 to 40 percent of the uh, total rice area for the deeper areas. So this is important for this uh, the fish. And then you, 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 the design itself is important to different model design. You can see, you see, uh, this is what we learn also with farmers. You use the we call a, a local uh, ecosystem approach to aquacultures. So that's some farmers are very uh, uh, do that kind of innovative. So you, you can have a large surface area in the whole rice field, but you can have uh, three small pond, uh, four small pond in the total rice area, and then uh, total rice, uh, total uh, total pond area. So when you want to harvest, you you uh, 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 reduce the water level, and then. The, all the fish, the culture species will be going to each pond, small pond. And when you have, when you sell, there's problem with the selling of the fish when, when you have two big ponds, when you catch a fish, you stress the fish and you uh, uh, make the fish losing weight. So it's not good. So the best way is to have different, like a small pond in there and then all the fish are good. And you have basically one pond after one pond, another pond, and then another pond. So this is another good model that's farmer uh, uh, apply and then this is a very good model. I can see that. So, so, so that's a uh, we need to just integration integration on that. So many, many of this rice field you know, in Asia, you know, it's pity to me. That's why our dedication is to make change our way of uh, do rice farming practices. Yeah. Uh, so what we do, we do by by ourselves, you know, even myself, I have my own farm. I started and then I work with the farmers, close to my farmers. So you learn. So you not preach what you're doing. You, you preach what you're doing. Uh, you do what you preach, okay? 
So that's why I learned a lot during the last two years that when I start having my own farm next okay. to the farmers, and then you learn it and you, you see and you learn, you go there often, you know, you learn. So you, you can have your own farm not far from this, where you live, you know, you can communicate, come, commute in the weekend so easily. So, and then where you can enjoy your, your learning. So that's important. Thank you. Thank you, Moni. And we have the last question because we actually ran out of time, but one question for our Thai call, DOF colleagues again. What are the challenges in getting more women participation in the enterprise? And how can we encourage more women to participate? Yeah, over to you. Oh. Uh, let me do the translation like this. And um, because of men, we we have the men on the field to do all the harvest and everything, but to be able to develop one product, we will encourage more people to participate with this from the learning from this enterprise that only um, eight out of 18 can do this. So we will uh, encourage them to be able to come with their more product, more innovative, and more process structure to be able to develop more um, qualified and the structure enterprise. Thank you. So we have actually over time and uh, we really appreciate our attendees and our panelists uh, staying with us and also to our panelists for uh, preparing their presentations and uh, delivering and uh, taking part in the Q&A. We also thank, uh, of course, our InfoFish colleagues for our organizing the webinars and for the technical uh, support. So uh, Rohana already presented about IAFA 2022, and you will find more information about uh, the International Year on the IAFA website. You just type in uh, International Year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture, and it will lead you to the website. And uh, tomorrow, we hope that you will join us again at uh, 1400 Bangkok time and uh, for the spotlight on uh, small scale fisheries. So once again, a big thank you to our uh, speakers, our resource persons, and uh, much appreciation to uh, our colleagues at uh, FAO RAP for the support and InfoFish. And so goodbye for now and stay safe and healthy and see you again tomorrow.